problem of education is worrying most of us at the present time. I remember back around 1925, I was giving a series of lectures in San Francisco, and the principal of the Galileo High School invited me to address an assembly at the high school. And there was a discussion as to what the subject would be. And finally, it was decided to use the same subject that I had been giving in my own series of lectures, and that was a study of Nordic mythology, all about the gods of the Northlands and so on. We had a very good assembly, probably 90% of the student body was there, and uh, I got an encore to come back for a second appearance, which also went off reasonably well. And uh, the young people seemed to be tremendously interested. They were interested because the stories were dramatic, exciting, picturesque, and uh, a little mythological. It was quite different from the rather conservative, basically monotonous type of education to which they had been exposed for a number of years. About three years ago, I was in San Francisco for a few days, and a white-haired lady came up to me, accompanied by a much younger woman. And she said, you probably don't know who I am, but I heard your lecture at the Galileo High School nearly 50 years ago. I've never stopped talking about it, and I've told my daughter for years, and I'd like you to meet her also. So it was old-time week, and in the discussion of the subject, the lady very kindly pointed out there was the only thing about Galileo High School she ever remembered. <laughs> so this seems to be one of our problems today. The curriculum is as dull as is conceivable. It is following a system of instruction that began about the beginning of the 14th century. Here we had the great universities that were under the cloisters of the church. The great schools like the Cap uh, Sapienza and the University of Basel in Switzerland were monuments of dignity. The faculties were aristocratic in every sense of the word, and the students were regarded as little better than trash, no matter where they came from. The professors sat in large gilded chairs and thrones and instructed the students in pedantic Latin, Greek, and whatever else happened to be the subject of the day. There was nothing of interest, nothing vital, nothing really useful in most of the curriculum. When Paracelsus of Hohenheim attended the University of Basel's medical department, he observed one day in public that the small fine hair on the back of his neck knew more about the practice of medicine than the entire faculty of Basel. This endeared him, of course, and not long afterwards he was assassinated, probably with the cooperation of the medical faculty. <laughs> We are much in this same condition today. The actual method of instruction has varied very slightly in the last several hundred years. Of course, there are many things taught today that were not taught then. They did not know a great deal about modern scientific thinking or modern industrialism, but they could make very dull matter out of whatever they were teaching, and we are doing the same now with what we are teaching. Also, it seems to be very little effort on the part of formal education to prepare young people for the mystery of living. They may be able to take a job, which of course is important in our time, and many of them suffer for years through the educational system for one reason only, and that is to find employment. They do not expect to have any enrichment of character or development of moral overtones from the curriculum. 
So we have today young people pouring out of our various educational institutions with practically no contribution to make to the improvement of the society to which they belong. If they majored in astronomy, they can count some more stars and look into the depths of black holes, but they still have no capacity for personal living. They cannot make a success of family or home or personal life. In every branch of learning, it is more or less the same. It is sterile. I have talked to a number of young college and university people lately, and they all say that it is dead. There is nothing of interest, nothing to stimulate thought, nothing to cause the individual to feel that he was truly increasing his own knowledge. He is simply remembering what is told. He follows the leader. If he doesn't follow, he is not likely to graduate at all. Many have dropped out simply because they couldn't learn anything they wanted to know. And it is a difficult and tragic matter for young people to graduate from a university or even a high school without any realization that they should not be in narcotics or something of this kind. We are in a very serious need of education. We are in need of the maturing of our mental lives. Most of all, we are in need of instruction which will teach us how to think. Now, in order to learn how to think, the individual must develop his own mental resources. But in most of the educational theories we have today, he is not taught how to think. He is simply told what to think. And he'd better agree. Also, of course, there are problems of advancement in knowledge which the Sapienza and the great universities of Germany and France never knew. That's the football team. <laughs> this is a very important social function. I know I heard a professor from one of the universities trying to defend the athletic side of the curriculum. He said it helps to build sportsmanship. And if you ever watch a football game, you'll see just what sportsmanship really is. It's a, a process of gradually slugging your way to victory. Also, sportsmanship has nothing to do with the ethics behind the football procedure. It is a discouraging a disillusionment for young people to believe that the institution they belong to is supporting some of the things that happen in professional athletics. So there is practically nothing left. Surely the individual may get a job, but even that is becoming more difficult all the time. He may be able to gradually advance in some highly technical profession, but even in this type of advancement, there are serious handicaps. A completely contemporary doctor, for example, must go back and study again a certain amount of work every year as long as he practices because of the changes in medical procedure. Same is true in legal procedure. The same is true in science. The young people of today who are studying the computer are completely new in a field that is comparatively recent. In a few years, this will be antique. Something else will take its place, and the individual will have to be educated all over again. There just is not enough pattern and not enough planning. The educational system is not thinking through its own procedures. It is simply taken for granted that it is a peer group that it will always be looked up to as the highest aspect of human culture. And then it will continue to do exactly what it has done for the last 700 years. What do we need then? We need something that will harness the capacities of a person. will make that person a more independent living being. 
a creature capable of personal decision, and also possessing the courage and moral stamina to maintain a high degree of individual conduct. These things are not even discussed in most schools unless they are seminarian. So today we are working with a very definite difficulty. Another problem that is confronting us is the cost of education. It is probably today more expensive than it can ever be worth. It forces families very often to forego the most important securities of life in order to educate children. And the education processes go on to infinity almost. I know a young man now who is still working for his doctorate. He is 39 years old and still going to school. He will probably graduate in time to retire. <laughs> and at that time will go on Social Security. <laughs> the education he received can serve him, preserve him for only a few years. This is utterly unnecessary. In order to take up all this time, he learns many things that he never needs to know, or as assembles a mass of opinions, beliefs, and doctrines that will never be of the slightest use to him in the problems of daily living. We are confronted, therefore, with a need, perhaps, for the re-establishment re of an apprenticeship system in education. We need to have individuals educated for their jobs by persons who know the job. And they, are lear they should learn by doing, and not by sitting in the back of an immense class, as one man that I know has done, where it was necessary for him to use binoculars to see the blackboard. <laughs> this type of thing produces not thinkers, but cut-out characters in streams and strings of people who are not able to face the emergencies of life with anything resembling dignity. Now, the uh, apprenticeship system would be very economical for all concerned and very useful. For one thing, the individual would learn comparatively without cost to the family. A small cost, perhaps, but nothing in comparison to sending that same young person through a university course. Instead of going to school to learn something he will never use, he has the right to select that which he believes he wishes to do and learn how to do it from people who are doing it instead of people who are reading it out of a textbook. I know a professor of architecture, or did years ago, he's gone now to his uh, blessed reward, who originally was a teacher of Greek. And because nobody in the university where he lived had any use for Greek scholars, he switched over to architecture. He had about a year in architecture when he took the class over, and for the rest of his service was one year ahead of his students. During his entire course and afterwards, he never built a house. All theory, no practice. Now, some do better than this. There's no question about it. But there's also no doubt that there's a tremendous amount of wasted time, wasted money, and more than that, crippling of the potentials of the person. We are concerned with the right of the individual to grow. Now, another aspect of this same situation, of course, is the repetitive procedure that is constantly adding to the cost of education. There is absolutely no excuse for the present use of vivisection as it is now used in medical colleges. If it is necessary for something of that kind to be done, it can be done once on film and shown to all the other schools. The idea that each one has to go through it himself is a completely devastating thing, and a great many are being um, offended so seriously they are leaving the colleges because they do not want to participate in torturing animals. If it has to be done, one university can do it, and all the others can simply watch the film. 
And this is true in many other fields, fields where the personal experience problem is not important in the sense that it's an observational procedure and can be observed off of good film just as well as in any other way. Also in the various procedures of scientific training, we used to have what might be called the Bell Letters or the humanities. We had courses for individuals who did not know why they were going to the university. They were going because their parents, friends, relatives, and so forth thought they should. Also, they were going for social contacts and the hope of either a better marriage or a more fortunate circle of acquaintances. This type of education is now practically defunct. Any family that tries to do this is simply wasting money and uh, the individual has no real value or advantage unless he at least went for a reason and for a purpose that was important to all concerned. From the very beginning of time, we watch the gradual change in educational procedures. Way back in the dawn of culture and civilization, education was almost completely a matter of association. It was a matter of the individual being with others of his own kind. Uh, when Socrates gave one of his discourses, he first prayed to the spirits of the place and then told his disciples what he thought they ought to know. It was then open to questions and discussions, and the teacher became a kind of parent, a, a godfather, a wisdom teacher over the lives of his disciples. In the Orient, it was a group of novices sitting under a tree with a guru, learning and studying the things that made life important to them. Everywhere in antiquity, education was largely a family affair or a community affair. If the individual wished to go further than this, if he wanted his education to go on to higher things, and he might, he then generally applied to the state for initiation into the rites and mysteries of religion. The state religion and the esoteric schools which accompanied it were the source of higher education. And the theory behind this was very simple. The young person was told by his family or by his local teacher who had worked with him that the purpose of higher education was to become more useful to society and that therefore all higher knowledge had to be dedicated to the service of God and humanity. There was to be no consideration of going through the esoteric schools in order to get a larger salary or hold public office. All increase of knowledge had to be dedicated to human need. And this human need was usually provided financially by the state. These schools were supported by the community. The instructors received very little or practically no compensation other than living. The disciples and students expected nothing more than that. They hoped that they would be able to go out and contribute to the common good. As a result of that, all higher education had a, an over-religious content. It was not assumed that anyone could use an education safely if he was an atheist. If he was not enlightened internally, if he was not dedicated to the need of humanity and graduated for the purpose of getting rich, he did not deserve an education and the community that supported this type of learning would itself crumble. All knowledge is dominated by dedication. It is for a reason. It is for a common good. It is for a usefulness, not that the individual shall carve out a competitive career. As a result of this older system, nearly all of the countries of antiquity had at least a group of highly specialized thinkers. Now, these persons were not always recognized, and they were seldom rewarded. That is true. But reward was not the principle involved. 
They were there to counsel with those who sought knowledge. And in most of the governments of antiquity, what we would call the prime minister was the one who was the oracle of the gods. The oracles of antiquity ruled the state. The state was, con was dominated by a concept of deity. Occasionally, some tyrant, a highly ambitious person, went over the traces and tried to do it his way. In a short time, he vanished because of the abuse of his own powers. So the uh, purpose of education was to discover not only more knowledge, but to realize the responsibility of knowledge. That the most uh, uh, serious dis dishonesty that's possible is religious and philosophical dishonesty. An individual who wants to use what he knows simply and entirely for his own benefit belongs to a group that could ultimately destroy the state. There has to be dedications. Now, what are the dedications that the ancients knew? The dedications to deity. The belief that this universe was a moral structure, that it had laws and rules, that these laws and rules were just, and education consisted of finding out what these rules were and gaining the interior dedication to keep these rules and to understand why they must be kept. An educated person, therefore, was one who knew why honesty was essential to survival. If you didn't know these things, you wasn't educated. Education also involved the realization of the common need. Every educated person must share what he knows, but most of all he must share part of himself which he has trained to various duties and responsibilities. He can become a teacher of the young. He can become a friend of the older. He can become a servant of the state. But in every form of function, he must be using what he knows for a common good beyond himself. He cannot simply hide his knowledge so that other people can't have it and therefore cannot compete with him. It is the duty of the wise person to make others as wise as possible. It is the re normal responsibility of the selfish, self-centered person to keep other people as ignorant as possible so that he can control them. Now, we have all kinds of situations like this rising around us in these difficult days, but we must come around finally to the realization that education, taking up as it does nearly a third of the life of the human being, should prepare him for something. At least it should make him a constructive citizen in his own community. It should make him capable of some moral decisions which are advantageous to other people. It must help him to live a kind of life that protects his family, that protects his children, and provides those around him with an example of right conduct. The individual, therefore, is educated who accepts the responsibility for his own conduct and realizes that this conduct is very essential to the survival, not only of himself, but of the world in which he lives. So we can ask ourselves simply, how many graduating from the great institutions of the modern world graduate as persons dedicated to the service of others? How many realize the na nature of laws as they are in the universe? How many have discovered the integrities of life? How many have been able to study just a little bit the way in which animals are educated, in which the family educates the child, in which the parent shows the way and leads the way? Comenius, the great Moravian educator, one of the founders of our public school system, talked about the mother school, where the child learned the first important lessons of life at his mother's knee. 
being told and shown the way of integrities, being given in time and attention and thought necessary to producing a constructive citizen. There is, of course, still a group that does this type of thing, but it is too small. For the majority, the individual is left to his own resources. The parents expect the school to educate him. The school knows it can't, so the church, school hopes the church might, and then makes it very definite and evident that the church doesn't count in the secular life of society. Well, this type of problem leaves everyone in a state of complete confusion. Now, I'm assuming that we have come through this confusion for a number of years and are still in a state of bewilderment as to the proper conduct and the proper way of improving our own natures, it may be that some individuals will have to wait and receive their education in the last few days of life. It may be. I always like that Greek story, which I guess I've told several times, but it will bear repetition today, about the old gentleman in the back room of the house in Athens who was on his deathbed, and the neighbors had all gathered in the front room to gossip and so forth until he left. And uh, someone happened to look into the back room, and the old gentleman was sitting up on the couch with his hand behind his ear, listening intently. One of them said to him, Father, why are you listening? You're not going to be here long. And the old man said, Well, I'm here now, and as long as I'm here, I can learn something. <laughs> and uh, too many people today are convinced that no matter how long they le live, they're not going to learn anything. And this has to be gradually changed by a different approach to knowledge. Each person should perhaps class, classify a series of factors within his own nature which would have some bearing upon him. In the first place, perhaps he should say, what did I always want to be? Am I doing the thing I really want to do? Have I sacrificed everything for a salary? Have I given up all my own hopes and aspirations because I'm completely disillusioned? Am I stuck in this rut because my responsibilities will not let me get out of it? There are all kinds of motivations behind the individual when he begins to study his own life. But there's one point that might be always useful to him. He may graduate from his career when he reaches retirement age. Then what he has or what he is able to accumulate becomes the basis of freedom of leisure. He may or may not feel a, a, able to take out another job. He might do a little something here and there. But it, for this person to simply sit down in front of a television for the rest of his life is a tragic mistake. Because it is in these years in which he is no longer being pushed by other circumstances that the time has come for him to push himself to get at the things that might improve his way of life. He can realize that he is not simply here to waste time. He is here to use time as best he can. Over a long, difficult period of, in, of employment, he has had very little time. And he has had even less because of the demands of family and the emergencies that have arisen along the way. But now he has some time. In fact, we all have some. It has been estimated in this country that the average person spends about four to six hours a day in front of television. Well, if this energy was used for something constructive, it might change the course of empire. But it is simply being wasted. And yet, as in the case of education, the various people who are actually watching are most of them completely disillusioned with the programs they are seeing. They're unhappy, they're unsound uh, in their own thinking about this matter. So we can say that nearly everyone has time to do something. So the problem is, what can he do that will help him to get rid of negative conditions in his own life? Is he disillusioned? If he is, there's a vast program that can be built to help him 
not to regain illusions, but to discover the good things that are facts that he has overlooked. He may be tired. He needs rest. Well, no one rests by doing nothing. People rest by changing attitudes into new fields and new opportunities, and the moment a true interest is developed, energy is there to supply it, at least in part. There may be various arts and crafts which we have had to neglect because of the pressures of economic necessities. Maybe the individual is a potential painter or sculptor. Perhaps he would make fine pottery, or perhaps he would work metals or weave or do one of many different things. But here he can develop a cultural instinct, which is very difficult to maintain during his periods of employment. In leisure, he has the opportunity to catch up a lot of things that he has never been able to do. Now, this is a very good problem because, after all, uh, most people who are serious thinkers have come to the conclusion that the life we live here is not the full story of our existence. If it was true, which apparently it isn't, that we are going to be judged forever as, as a result of the present occupations, we'd all be in terrible trouble. We wouldn't get very far unless we can grow beyond the limitation of the growth we achieve here. But if in our older years we make a very definite effort to grow, to become wiser, to be more thoughtful, to gain a new and deeper dimension of, in, of insight and understanding, the uh, Oriental and many others in the West now would say these are the things we can take with us into the future. These are the things that can be of service to us if we come back into this world. If we do reincarnate, the things we do in the last days of life can, now can be very important then. So what, regardless of what we are dedicated to philosophically or religiously, there cannot be very much criticism for, from anyone because we desire to grow, desire to be better, more kind, more intelligent, more generous, and more thoughtful of others. These are virtues which are respected if, even if they are not emulated by other people. So we can start in with the point where we are and try to find out what we can do with the 10 or 15 years of life that is left that can do more for us than anything we have ever learned in school. There's one other advantage of this that we should also take into consideration, and that is that in this post-retirement period of growth, we are able to make use of a very involved but remarkable pattern of personal experiences. We have been through a lot of things before we got to retirement. We have had various disillusionments. We have had hopes and fears. We have had responsibilities. We have made friends and, unfortunately, some enemies. We have lived in various political convictions, social convictions, orthodoxies of religious thinking. We have lived in all kinds of situations, and we have had children that got themselves into all kinds of situations and depended largely on us in some cases to get them out. With all this backlog of experience, therefore, we have the most priceless ingredient of growth. If we can sit down and rationalize what has happened to ourselves in the proper manner, we can achieve a great deal. This is more or less the contemplative discipline of Pythagoras, that we should look back upon the day upon the year, upon the life, and determine what we have actually learned. During busy years, we probably have had the experiences, but we have never learned much from them. We had no time to rationalize them. We didn't have the incentive or the judgment to philosophize on the miseries of the day. So we went along, casting them off, blaming them on other people, regretting that we live in a benighted era, and blaming the politicians, the lawyers, the hospitals, the teachers, and everyone for the problems we have. But as we reach this period of maturity, 
there is a very interesting situation taking place within ourselves. The mind, weary with sophisticated thinking, begins to simplify of its own accord. Some say that this is a second childhood. Well, maybe it is. But if it is, it has the most important ingredient, ingredient of childhood, namely, interest in knowing. It has become more and more evident that certain simple factual events and circumstances have dominated our experiences. So we can begin to see what was done to us as well as what was done for us by the life through which we have passed. In working this out, we have the basis of a new attitude toward religion, toward society, politics, government, everything. One of the things that the thoughtful person nearly always does learn, and is very valuable to him, is that he has always had the tendency to blame others for his troubles. It is always easy to consider other people unreasonable, even as other people consider us unreasonable. But this lack of acceptance of experience and blaming others for it is the one point that Lord Bacon very clearly pointed out, that you have to use experience honestly if you want to learn from it. Unless experience points out your own defects, your own inabilities to meet circumstances, then you have not judged it correctly. And even in retirement, experience can help us to meet the remaining years of life with an understanding that we could not gain by any book reading or by any indoctrination. Experience is on our own flesh. It is something that we cannot really get away from very far. We cannot deny it successfully. The point is to use it wisely and to find out that from experience we discover facts, whereas from inexperience we only multiply theories. So with this type of thinking, the person can start in to do something with daily living. There is a move in this direction also that does not just affect older people. There is considerable revolt among the young. Young people today feel that they are locked into an impossible situation. They are not yet tired out. They have not become so exhausted they can form as the line of least resistance. They are still a little belligerent. If they wait long enough, of course, and get enough responsibility, they too probably will fall into the current errors. But at the beginning, they really would like to do it better. The result is that there are a number of schools rising up, there are a number of individual groups taking over their own education, and there are all kinds of policies being developed to help the individual uh, to live according to a personal standard of integrity. Now, integrity, again, is supported largely by experience. A great many of those today who are searching for more honesty in life are the ones that a few years ago were on marijuana. But they have discovered that mistake, and they have learned from that experience something that is desperately important. They are trying to straighten themselves out, realizing that the line of least resistance, the joy living that meant nothing, has gotten them into serious trouble. Little by little, experience is bringing younger people into the realization of the inadequacy of prevailing policies. Now, we don't want them to follow into another mistake, and that is through, uh, through revolution and violence. What they have to do is realize the importance of changing themselves. The only way we can get at this very complicated situation successfully is that individuals take over the education of their own lives, take over the characteristics and integrities they believe to be correct. Now, it isn't hard to find these integrities if you really want to be honest. They're everywhere. And in spite of all of our negative attitudes towards the experiences of society, they are the source of instruction. 
They not only tell us what we should do, but they tell us what we should not do, or that we should stop doing, or that we should never have started to do. All these uh, dimensions become apparent to us in the course of time. Now, I know from working with religious people that religious education is one of the most complicated forms of it. Religious education has never been basically uh, integrated on a purely factual level. There, there seems to be no one who really doubts too seriously the law of gravity or can question the efficacy of modern physics. These things become more or less patterns of acceptance. But in matters of religion, the, the landmarks are rather dull or dim. The individual is not sure of things. He is not sure, for instance, that there is an integrity in life. He is not sure that there is a God, just or unjust. He does not know whether life is a rebellion against evil or a cultivation of good. He is not sure that when he passes out of here he will have a future existence, and if so, where it will be and upon what level. These things leave a great many doubts, and answers to these doubts are not readily available. There is not some infallible source to which we can turn with absolute certainty that certain beliefs can be demonstrated scientifically and that therefore they can become the basis of a firm, workable, spiritual tradition. Well, it's not quite as bad as it looks. The only thing is the average person hasn't looked in the right place for his facts. He must look for his facts in the very experiences of existence. Everything that we study should help us to understand why we are what we are and, if possible, what we can do about it. We must begin to recognize that there are uh, sign posts along the way. There are marks and indications that can help us. But instead of thinking of these things in terms of dogmas, we have to think of them in terms of cause and effect. We have to realize from experience, from history, from biography, from the most exact sciences up and down, <coughs> from all the arts and traditions, that there are rules in life. That these rules are in, uh, unchangeable, inevitable, <coughs> and that these rules we must keep. And they go, those who keep the rules get the answers. Those who break the rules do not get the answers. And if we want the answers, we have to live according to the laws. Gradually, through the very simple problem of living with each other, the rules become more or less obvious. There are things we find we can do and things we cannot do. There are also big moments when we do something we think is wonderful and it turns out badly. We know that every action has an, a reaction, and that if we want to grow, want to improve, want to become educated people, we must be able to classify the reaction of conduct, our own and everyone else's. It is far more important to discover what we cannot do and keep the rules than it is to add a vast amount of superficial education that tells us nothing. It does not help us to discover what is wrong. And the education itself is not necessarily showing us what is right. Therefore, we have to supplement this situation. I know several younger persons today who have had fair educational backgrounds, and every one of them is satisfied that he cannot live with what he's learned in school. It will not work. It will do certain things, but it will bring with it a series of consequences that he cannot stand. And if he is faced by them, they may destroy him. One of the common uh, enemies of the human mind is success. And, of course, we all are looking for that. Success has to be estimated in terms of experience. To some people, Napoleon was a success. 
Others were, do not agree with this. Some, uh, and a good many, believe that the most successful person who ever lived was Jesus Christ. Others do not think so. They believe that the, the success is in terms of wealth, worldly power, influence, and intense competition. Well, they believe this. And schooling hasn't changed this belief. It hasn't done a thing to moderate it even. It has only promised the graduate that if he does what he's told, he'll get a larger swimming pool. But this isn't what he's really in, in need of. It's nice to have and all that type of thing, but if he has to barter his integrity to get it, he's going to get in more trouble than the luxuries are worth. He has to find this out. He has to experience it. He has to come to the firm conclusion that there are rules that he must keep, and that if he keeps these rules, they will keep him. So, younger people today are out looking for the rules. They are forming their own groups to do certain useful things. They want to get back to the land. They want to get to the point where they're self-supporting in the simple needs of life. They want to find ways in which they can work together for mutual advantage. And to many of them, it is very important that the environment which they create has religious values. As a result of this search for religious values, we have had an upsurge of religion all over the world. An upsurge that has one very interesting factor, namely that for the first time, many people are coming in contact with a religious belief about which they have not been disillusioned. Many of the people who are naturally religious have been disillusioned uh, by the unfortunate situations that arise within local theological groups. But some religion or philosophy that they have never had any contact with but directly, but which has ideas that they consider to be ethically correct, will serve them better because they have not been through it and disappointed. So many new ideas and new beliefs have a strong following by those who are tired of the old ones that have never worked. On the other hand, the older groups are also making changes. They are becoming more concerned with social circumstances. They are beginning to believe and realize that religion has something to do with families, that it has something to do with the growing of children, that it has something to do with the psychological, emotional relationship of the individual to his job and to the society of which he is a member. So many of the older, more conservative groups are branching out into social service programs and also into psychological programs for the service of their younger members or whoever may need help. So we now have psychological, uh, religious counseling. We have the realization dawning upon us that religion has something to do with a good life well lived, here, now. That the consolation of faith is its power to reform our own lives. So we have healing groups, holistic groups that believe definitely that every art or science that we practice must have its religious foundations or it will not survive. We also become aware that the religious elements contribute largely to therapy, either preventive or curative, and that the only thing that is a real help to the psychiatrist or psychologist working with afflicted people is the possibility of reaching them on an idealistic level, reaching them on an inspirational foundation pointing out better things, more important things, in which they can have faith, and which will never and can never disappoint them. So we find more and more religion involved in almost everything we do. But, of course, the moment this happens, another factor comes in. Most uh, theological seminaries give their graduates a considerable conditioning in the management of a religious organization or institution. They are warned from the beginning 
of the difficulties of maintaining a high ethical level in the profession of the clergy, that the pressures on them probably are greater than on any other se section of society. The individual who is dedicated to doing it right has more enemies than probably anyone else in the world simply because people do not want to do it right if it interferes with doing what they want to do. And religion has to be so conditioned that it is available as a spiritual reference frame, but nobody is expected to live according to its rules. This is a tax upon almost any idealistic minister. It is a problem that he has to face, and it is a problem that has driven many out of the clergy. The fact that it is a struggle to maintain a church in which you can teach people to be more honorable and at the same time hold the congregation. They tell you, yes, they believe everything you say, but they do exactly as they please in their personal relationships. So this problem still requires a great deal of conditioning. Now, probably one of the interesting elements of this point is that we, if we think of deity as a factor of retribution only, we also have been asked uh, theologically the question whether deity can damn parts of itself. Can deity cast part of its own creation into hell? This seems to be a rather unlikely situation. So what we commonly think of as punishment from deity is simply the reaction of our own attitudes which are incorrect. It isn't deity damning us. It is ourselves getting our own lives into conditions that we cannot solve. We do not know what to do after we finally paint ourselves into a corner. So in those emergencies, sometimes we do what the sick man does. We go to the doctor, but as soon as we feel better, we forget the physician. This type of thing brings with it a, a sense of why, if, why have we grown up this way? Why is it that from childhood on we were not taught a few simple facts? Why are we not able to discriminate now? Why are we still shopping for religion? Why are we still striving to get as much as we can and give as little as possible? Why are we perfectly willing to vote for somebody who promises again that somebody else is lost? We don't know why we do these things. But well, one of the reasons is the school system has failed us. We should have known better by the time we got out of grammar school. We should have graduated from high school with de determined and dedicated values in ourselves. We should have a clear vision of what is best for us and best for the community and realize clearly that when we compromise our own integrities, we are responsible for our own misfortunes. So we, we, get, we get up to the point, almost to retirement sometimes, in which we have never accepted or experienced the need for integrities. They are something other people should have. They are something that the world certainly needs, but they're something that interfere with our doing what we want to do. And that's a mistake. If, however, we could get some form of educational structure and parents are beginning to worry about this more than a little. All over this country, and in many other countries also, parents are getting together to form organizations and groups to supervise the moral life of their children, and their own moral lives, for that matter. They are beginning to realize that if there's to be any integrity, honesty, kindliness, sympathy, understanding, and true progress, in humanity at this stage of things, it has got to come from personal effort. It cannot be uh, dependent upon the major institutions which we have created and which we have thoroughly corrupted. 
So all over, people are beginning to think of trying to do something themselves to warn their children, to warn their friends, to indoctrinate young people with better ideas and convictions. And the young people are beginning to notice it. They are beginning to create a new concept of what constitutes a peer group. They all want to follow the example of the most popular member of their class or in their school. But when they see this popular member in the hospital as a hopeless narcotics addict, he doesn't quite look like a peer anymore. He does not seem to have the glamour, the glamour that came from living wildly is damaged when you see what happens to the wild livers. They get into one difficulty after another. And young people who are still not completely under the influence of uh, economic pressures are beginning to see the facts of life. They are beginning to realize the mistakes they're making, and they don't wish to continue them. We also have the same problems arising with older people who are continuously killing each other on the road with their accidents, who are drunk driving and uh, narcotics addict driving, and one by one these glamorous personalities fade out in misery, sorrow, and distress, and death. This type of thing is affecting young people. Here, experience, observation, and reflection are coming into their own. But this is being forced upon them by their own mistakes. There should be some basic standard acceptable to persons in all ages by means of which the more grievous mistakes can be avoided or prevented or if they exist corrected as speedily as possible. Now we get out into the big world of knowledge. Here we have science. Here we have the great discoveries which are threatening the survival of humanity. We are getting these discoveries from the great institutions that we have regarded as infallible. It is the great university and the great laboratory that is now giving us the great headache. And yet we are assuming, or taught to assume, that these people who are creating these disasters are the greatest, noblest, and most thoroughly trained of our citizens. That they are the ones who know. They are the ones who have gained the full advantage of education, but are graduating without any realization of responsibility to humanity. Education is in for trouble. And this trouble is spreading, and it's spreading now. The time is very much in, in sight in which there has to be a new estimation of what constitutes knowledge. We have to begin to realize that knowledge without integrity is the greatest falsehood of all. That the knowledge of advancement and progress must be measured in one thing. The only way in which progress can be properly estimated is in terms of securities. Securities are those values, the practice of which will bring no detriment to anyone. We have to realize that the entire problem of our modern way of life is that we must find out what constitutes progress. Is progress just simply complication. Is progress a substitution of a robot for a human mind? Is progress the enlargement of nuclear research? Is progress the rising value of gold on the stock exchange? Is progress wealth? Is it the exhaustion of natural resources? Is it the permission by which we allow our planet to be ravaged of everything that is of value? Is progress proven by crime, degeneracy, disease, mental breakdowns, and death? If so, then progress is not worth cultivating. Progress must be 
man's gradual maturing of his own life, a better life, a richer life, a more useful life. Uh, progress must be that he can come home and sit down quietly and think in peace, that he is fairly selective in the things that he does, that he will not support that which is useless, worthless, or dangerous, that he will not waste his time trying to forget the problems of society when he should be using every faculty that he has to find ways in which he can maintain his integrities and assist others to do the same. So we have this problem that we have worshipped progress. We have worshipped the concept of Star Wars. We have worshipped all kinds of extraterrestrials. We have worshipped the planet of the apes. This type of thing is now considered to be amusement, informative, and just a little prophetic. We all have certain fears that the worst things we are watching might come true. Why are we doing this? What has happened? We didn't gain this from the basic concept of education as it was known in ancient times. We did not get these thoughts from Plato or Aristotle. We did not get them from Buddha or Christ. We did not get them from any of the real patrons of progress that we know. We have always been taught to use life intelligently. We have been taught of the dignity of simple things. We have been taught to be moderate in all ways. We have been taught never to be slaves of our own possessions, and yet we have never learned the lesson. All we do is keep on in the same way. And it will probably go on that way until we come up against a major issue that we are not going to be able to meet by platitudes or by raising the national debt. We are going to come to something that needs what we have needed for a long time and that is a completely new outline of how to teach people what to do and how to live. And we cannot depend upon working only with the older generation. We have to start in with young people. We should have people working all the time to improve the curriculum, to find out what young people need to know. And there is a great need for a complete rewriting of most textbooks. The textbooks are miserable things. They are enough to discourage anybody. They are monotonous. They are hard-headed and uh, difficult, complicated. They have no life in them, no reality in them. A young man I was talking to not long ago was talking about a history book he was in his class. He said that the book was so dry, so definitely factual according to a concept of fact, that the truth was never in it. There was no understanding of anything. There was no real appreciation of anything. And when the entertainment field makes a so-called historical film, it is so distorted that it has lost all value as far as educational importance. Everywhere we are distorting things that we should rationalize. Children's textbooks should be things they love to read, that teach them nice and good values, and they learn to love them. That there is excitement, there is variety, there is change, and everything that is taught excites constructive imagination and gives the individual a sense of participation in the problems of living. The uh, school curriculum is at least a hundred to two hundred years behind its times. And every teacher who tries to do anything about it that is constructive is likely to be sent into the suburbs. There is no interest in these things. The status quo, a kind of a deep hypnosis, has enveloped us, a sort of intellectual smog. And this smog is rising from a whole group of corrupted processes which we do not need and should not have. One thing, however, we can realize, that in spite of all of this situation, we are still individuals. 
We do not have to do the things that we do not believe are right, or at least to the best of our ability, we can minimize our faults if we cannot completely eradicate them. We can also add to the picture a strong statement of values so that we can, little by little, manage our own affairs. If we can do this properly, we will recover from another danger of the moment, and that is complete disillusionment, the breaking down of our psychological integration, worrying ourselves to death, frightening ourselves to death, and uh, waiting each day for more bad news is not good for the human being. It is not good to live this way. It is not good for the person to feel that the situation is hopeless and helpless, and that there is nothing he can do about it anyway. Actually, there are things he can do about all these things. One thing he can do is to decide in his own mind whether things are helpless and hopeless. In order to really get that philosophy of life deeply embedded in our natures, we have to carefully and conscientiously avoid all that is good. We have to take away from our thinking the long-range policies that might in the long run be of the greatest value to the greatest number. We have to watch the disaster but forget why it happened and what we should be doing about it. There are many ways in which the individual can restore a certain basic sense of values. And one, of course, of these most important weapons or instruments, if you want to call them that, is faith. The realization that somewhere in the pattern of things, this vast universal mystery of which we belong, that extends through countless billions of stars, as far as thought and mind can travel and beyond the reach of the most exalted imagination, that all this great pageantry of things cannot be disrupted and destroyed by a few stupid human beings. That in all that we can do to destroy ourselves is to make a minor mess of things. But in the universe we are not going to become to the end of anything. The greater pattern of things is that when we get to a certain degree uh, with fatigue, we will drop out of the material world and come back later. But in the great picture of things, everything is working together for good. The difficulty is we don't appreciate that kind of good. Our idea of good is luxury. We wish to drift to heaven on flowery beds of ease. We want to think only of deity as infinite benevolence, regardless of our mistakes, and ready to forgive even the, ma the major mistakes that we make. Actually, behind all of this pessimism, which is affecting us, and which does affect us, there is ground for a great realization that these things could not happen if there were not laws. We can't break something that doesn't exist. We cannot go against that which has no existence or reality. The reason in we are in trouble is because there are laws, and these laws are right. They are honest, they are difficult, but they are real. We are therefore constantly in the presence of the fact that our destiny is being protected at the expense of our appetites. We are going to have to change our own ways but we are not headed for destruction. We are only headed for a disillusionment in things that never had any reality anyway. Education should begin to work with these problems. It should take every incident that arises in our confused political situation today and explain to young people why there is confusion, what is wrong, and what should be done about it and with the newspaper in one hand and the piece of chalk in the other, a school teacher could accomplish quite a good deal. It's just the problem of getting a point of view. But if your point of view isn't what the majority of people want, you have a hard time putting it over. But today, the majority of people is becoming more aware of this, 
and day by day every newspaper contains reports of new groups of private citizens getting out and doing the things that need doing. This is good. The reason they are doing it that way is because that was the way they were supposed to do it in the first place. We were never supposed to allow public officials to do our thinking for us. We were, we were right in assuming a certain parental leadership. And if that leadership is wrong, then we do not have to follow it. It's just like a family with drunken parents. If this is the situation, it is not necessary that all the children become alcoholics. It is this just the lack of the organization of life. It's the failure of education to actually educate people to be people, to be intelligent human beings. In Buddhism, we have this concept of the universal commonwealth, the great commune of existence. We are all citizens of something that extends beyond the stars. We are part of a tremendous universal democracy. We are part of a merit system that extends beyond the most distant galaxy. We are part of a rule that says, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. And if we begin to realize that to the point that we realize that by sowing we must reap what we sow, therefore it is better to sow good seed in the first place, when we reach that we will begin to be educated, because that is the basis of education that the individual is responsible for his own actions, and, and groups of individuals are responsible for collective action. If the individual is willing to accept a universe in which laws are real, if he is willing to accept a purposeful destiny for existence, if he is willing to assume that this vast machinery of life that we know is governed by a primordial consciousness and intelligence, that there is a divine spirit, a universal soul behind all manifestation, and that this is not a theological problem, it is actually a scientific problem. The, tr the real science is cause and effect, immutable. One thing we can depend upon absolutely, a fact of cause and effect and that this law is the primary manifestation of the divine purpose. That this law is the thing which has to be gradually discovered, built into a curriculum for the education of the young and the re-education of the old, built into a pattern by which we gradually come to accept what the ancients knew long ago, namely that there is a universal divine destiny that shapes the ends of everything that lives and that regardless of what we think, this destiny is constantly working. We cannot deny it and then look even into the pages of contemporary history. We cannot read the daily newspaper without seeing final proof of cause and effect. We cannot watch the histories of the great, the strong, the evil, and the mediocre without realizing there is law and order in space and in place. Everything is ruled by principles that are infallible. And those are the only principles we have to obey. We do not have to obey corrupt man-made concepts of life, but we have to obey the divine plan of things. We have to recognize and accept that we are part of a great motion, and that this motion has as its ultimate the release and perfection of each living thing. We are all ensouled by a power that will not die. We are all part of a plan that cannot fail. And our great securities and our great hopes and our great fulfillments lie in the acceptance of our proper destiny. And where in the world are we going to go unless these facts become part of the basic training of every child that comes into this world. Why are we going to hope that we can sow in corruption and reap in security? We can't do it. 
everything has to be according to its own rules. The beginning of education, therefore, is to learn the rules of life. It isn't the beginning of education to do watercolor painting or basket weaving. It is not part of life for the average person today to learn Greek and Latin unless that's the thing he's dedicating his life to. It is, however, necessary regardless of specialization in medicine, in law, in science, theology, arts, crafts, that the beginning of education is to realize that in the beginning is integrity and that this integrity fulfills all the purposes of knowledge. Without it, all knowledge must inevitably fail. So somehow we've got to get this into the consciousness of educators. The only way we're going to get it into their consciousness, probably, is through the continuing, continuing failure of what they are doing. Little by little, they're going to alienate themselves. They're going to, be, they're going to lose, lose their leadership. They are going to be no longer respected and regarded. And the mistakes that they do not correct will be held against them in the fullness of time. In the meantime, we can't make all the major changes, but we can gradually bring our own personal conduct under the control of a universal law. Except that we are responsible for our actions. If we injure the body, we are responsible for its sickness. If we injure the neighbor, we are responsible for social and local crime. If we do one thing or another which damages, hurts, aids the evil things of life, we are responsible for the results. If we drive the car with too much alcohol, we are responsible for the tragedy that follows. There is no such a thing as constructive irresponsibility. There is no way in which we can do just as we please, no matter how selfish it is, in a world in which we must do just what is right or all tr is trouble for all concerned. In the last 50, 75 years, there's been a very serious deterioration in world integrities. This deterioration is the result of the gradual elevation of industry and economics. We are now living under a profit system in which the profits, unfortunately, uh, are not very substantial. Little by little, a materialism, which was never real in the first place, is going to fail us utterly. This is not going to end in poverty for all concerned. It is going to end in a greater security and a greater uh, participation in universal benefits than we have ever known. If we can get the things straightened out, we will never have to put a man in jail for stealing a loaf of bread. We will never be forced to the various corrective methods that we use now, which are simply compensation for the mistakes we make. We have to get into the entire educational system gradually, and in our own hearts and minds first, from there we have to work the realization that it is perfectly obvious and evident that the plan is succeeding. The failure lies in our inability to decide what is success. We are gradually succeeding, but we are growing the hard way. We are forcing situations so that we must grow by disillusionment when in reality, by clinging to the facts and the principles and the integrities to begin with, we grow not with disillusionment, but with increasing realization of the eternal providence and its benevolence. Therefore, we don't have to work with these problems as best we can. But one of the things that's got to be done is to realize that education is impossible without a concept of universal purpose that no one can be educated who simply thinks in terms of one little lifespan and how he can accumulate as much as possible to leave to someone who doesn't deserve it. We have to have a better vision. And as we have a better vision, we will have better health and live longer. We are destroying ourselves by wrong attitudes, and no one can save us from them but ourselves. And to know this, is the primary end of education, that each individual must grow up 
into the use of his own potentials and share with others every virtue and value that he possesses. If we begin to think in this direction, even if it doesn't work right away, it will help, and in the course of time, we're going to be much happier and a better people. Well, that's it.